So I'm starting. Hey, yes. everybody. Welcome to Crossroads. My name is Joe. I am one of the pastors around here. It's nice to see you this morning. I have some announcements for us, and I got a whole bunch. So stick with me. First one is right after this service, there is a annual meeting follow-up. The annual meeting follow-up is a real simple thing. We just go over what's been going on in the church since our annual meeting in January. We had some goals. We kind of met most of those goals. So we'll tell you about those. Feel free uh, to hang out with us. If you're like, but I got to get to breakfast. We got breakfast for you right here. You can stay, you can hang out. If you're not a member and you'd like to learn more about what it means to be a member, that's a good opportunity to do that. And here's the key on membership. It, we are a bottom-up church. And what that means is, the people of the congregation run the church through the leaders of the church. But you guys vote for pastors and budgets and, and those types of things. So feel free to join us uh, for that and learn more about what it means to be a part of the church. And recognize, the other thing I like about annual meetings, it's a reminder to all of us, the church is the people, right? It's not, it's not the leaders, it's all of us together as one make up the church. All right, we got a work day coming on Saturday, the 12th at 9 a.m. And this is going to be outside. We're going to be putting in some paver blocks and extending some pathways over there in the garden. So this is going to take everybody. If you, if you got a strong, what is it, strong back, weak mind? Is that how that thing works? We need you. All right, so... Uh, because we are going to be having to pick up, uh, pick up some blocks, but we can use everybody in terms of making that uh, look nice out there. The Quest Party is for grades 3 to 5. It's always a blast. It's coming up on Friday, the, October the 18th. Have your kids sign up at the children's ministry table. And then, I just, I just love this, uh, the, the Christmas pageant. I mean, you put... You put a little kid in a halo and get him reading the Bible. He's not here, but uh, <laughs> but you put a little kid in a halo and then you give him the Christmas story from Luke. And I don't. You, we could do that every week, and I would not get bored of it. So if you want, if you want your kids to be a part of that on October the thirteenth after the service, we're gonna do. We're just gonna have an information meeting, and we're looking for. Older kids this year, too, for some of the uh, more difficult speaking parts. So it's like kindergarten through high school can be a part of that thing this year. And it's a blast. Trunk or Treat is coming up on October 27th. This is also a really fun time. The way this works is it's, again, because the church is all of us. So we, people in the congregation, you know, decorate their your trunk kind of festive, kind of you know, uplifting, and, uh, you know, don't do the super scary stuff. You see the littles that run around this place. We don't want to, like, I went to church, and I <laughs> scary ghost jumped out at me, and I'm never going again. Um, but 
but we decorate, and you can also have the kids do a game. I understand Pastor Dave this year is really excited to do Pie the Pastor again. Like, that's, he's really looking for. Pastor Jen's going to be part of that. No. <laughs> So um, so that, that's October 27th. It'll be right after this service. We do do lunch with that. So we have a little lunch. We give you a, a few minutes after the service to get your car ready and your trunk ready. And then the kids just go around. And it really is a, it is a fun time. The garage sale is over. But there are some things that are left over. And so our ask is this. If you got a pickup truck or a big trunk and... You can take a couple of things over to Salvation Army and help us clean it out. If For those of you who helped break that thing down and you saw all the stuff that was in there, it's a lot of it's been taken and a lot of it's gone. But we have some bigger things, uh, some bikes and things, that if you could take them over to Salvation Army, uh, we would appreciate it. If there's any scrappers in the room and you just want to go have it all, rock on. Uh, we'd appreciate it. All right, we do want you to be connected around here. You can stay uh, connected by doing what you're doing right now, showing up at church in the room or online. For those of you who are online, if you want to join us at uh, the annual meeting, uh, email went out earlier this week, and it went out four minutes ago, so it just hit your inbox so that you would have it at the top of, your, at the, top of the list. But in that email, there's a Zoom link that you can link to to uh, come and join us in the meeting. You'll be able to talk, and people, you'll be able to hear what's going on in the room. If you have questions, you'll be able to ask them uh, through the Zoom. And then also the handouts are in that email. You can just click on that so you can see what it is uh, that we're talking about. And with that, so there was a lot of announcements. That was a lot of announcements. I do have one more. Thank you, Michael. Hey. I do have one more announcement. If you are planning on going to the men's retreat, please see uh, Mike at the sound booth after the service so that carpooling can be worked out. If you're like, men's retreat? I was thinking I might do that. I didn't even know where to do that. That sounds like fun. I would like to do that next weekend. How do I sign up? See Mike in the back, and he'll be happy to get you signed up. All right? With that, let's stand, let's lift our voices, and join Jen and the team as they lead us in our call to worship. All right, and you guys are going to follow along with Laura, the big bold words. Our help is in the name of the Lord our God, the maker of heaven and earth, who comes to our aid in times of need, who gives us the courage to do what we know is right, who invites us to turn away from the influences of the world around us, and confess Jesus alone as Savior and Lord. This is our God. Let's worship together. to turn around and say good morning to someone around you.
morning. Morning, I'm uh, Dave, if you don't know that, one of the pastors here. And it's a time in our service where we take our offering and somebody's going <laughs> to, I heard it, I'm coming. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe and Joanne will be pat- giving you the baskets and then keep them moving behind you and they'll collect them in the back. Uh, if you're visiting with us, let the baskets pass you by. We're just really glad you're here. Uh, and it's also a time in our service where you know we look at some scripture and looking at this one from Romans where Paul's talking to the church, and he says something really important. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing and perfect will. And it's just a reminder that, you know, we, we talk about offering, and that reminds us of giving of our time, our treasure, our talent, our story, our testimony. Um, but it's also a reminder, the scripture is that our worship is never stops. Our worship is part of our life. It includes our thinking. And our thinking, and my thinking, needs a lot of transformation because it can go off, you know, in a direction that's not helpful. And so this just reminds us that our bodies, we're just, it's a living sacrifice. We keep giving up and giving ourselves to God in our daily life. Also, some prayer needs. Uh, we want to lift up, uh, want to lift up uh, Rick Nemi, who took a fall, and he's recovering from that. And his wife, uh, Mary Jo, they're kind of struggling together on that. And um, we want a little praise report before we pray, too, because somebody... Pastor Test, uh, Kelly, for coding, right? Medical coding. Yeah. So she knows, she knows all the Latin and Greek roots. And so you can just ask her any kind of name and she'll, she'll know that. <laughs> oh, wow, that is big. That is really something to celebrate. Uh, and my mother-in-law is in the hospital right now, Jean, so we will uh, lift her up as prayer. And then we'll also have a place where we can lift up anything that's on your hearts, uh, those intentions. So we pray with Rick and Steve. We got Rick Nemi. Yeah. Oh, Steve Dominic. Yeah, because that's right. He took a fall. Too, so okay well father god just pray for steve right now we just pray that for his recovery that you'll bring healing to his body that you'll use uh the people in his life the who are supporting him whether those are medical people or family um, just pray that you will be with all of them and that he will be able to recover and get back to health we pray that for rick too lord that you will help him to get back on his feet, to be able to um, just feel healing in his body, healing in his mind and soul. Uh, for his wife, that you'll be with her as well, Mary Jo. And we just pray for Jean, that as she's in the hospital, that you'll give doctors wisdom, that you'll give us as family members wisdom on decisions to make. Um, and we just thank you and pray your comfort on her and all those who are suffering. We lift all the people that are on our hearts to you right now. You know all the needs, Lord. We give those to you. Father, thank you so much for hearing our prayer. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, kids, you got Miss Shannon in the back. You want to go, and the rest of us, let's stand up and continue to worship. Love 
22 from the book of Amos. It says, witness the one, the one who shapes the mountains and fashions the wind, who, reveal, who reveals his thoughts to human beings, and who changes dawn to darkness and treads upon the high places of the earth. The eternal God, commander of heavenly armies, is his name.
Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we cry out to you. We cry out for your wisdom and your way, and that's what I want us to be guided by this morning. Your wisdom and your way. So if my words get in the way, just let them go away. So your light would shine in this time and place. In Jesus' holy name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. You can grab a seat. We are going to do communion a little bit later in our service. For those of you who are wondering, because this is our typical time that we would do uh, communion. And are you, I'm confused. I know. You're like, okay. So what else is new? Um, Dave, will you see if pa Pastor Ben is, are we, I don't know if we're doing 6th through 9th, because 6th through 9th is really tired this morning. They did, um, oh, we are doing it. Okay. All right, 6th through 9th grade. You can go with Pastor Ben. He is at the back door. He is ready for you. If they look tired, it's because we had the 11-hour blitz on Friday night. Oh, my gosh. That thing, first of all, I did get a chance to hang out with them for a little bit. I did not pull the all-nighter. Uh, that is way, 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 way in the past for me. So, but it was just fun. These kids are, they're just cool, and they know how to have fun together, and they know how to laugh together. We had, I think it was 25, 25 kids and doing their thing and having fun. So it was, it was awesome. So we started a new series today. It's called Beyond the Ballot Box leading with our faith identity in contentious times. I got to tell you uh, how m messages like this come about. So we, you know, we have a team and a team that gets together. And because we don't, like in church, you can follow a schedule of readings. Those of you who uh, come from more traditional uh, churches, you may be used to that. And we do that from time to time, like before Christmas, we'll follow the readings. Before Easter, we'll follow the readings. Sometimes in the summer, we'll do that. But we, you know, we pick. We pick the different, you know, messages. And so, so we're there, and we're doing the brainstorming thing. And Pastor Ben, our youth pastor, is like, you know, so this is early in the summer, and we're looking out toward the fall. He's like, well, you know, there is an election coming don't you think we should say something about that? And I got, what went inside, in, what happened inside me was just like, <sighs> can we not? Yeah. Amen, right? Like, can we not? But then, it, it, it's so important that we address, right, like, we address the things that split us apart. We address the things that draw us away from God. So in all these, right, beyond the ballot box, because we have to remember, as people who follow Jesus Christ, like sometimes we can get into this mindset that all our energy goes to that, and then, and then the vote happens, okay, and then we're done. We're like, no. Then our work just begins, yeah. Right? To, to, to move beyond the ballot box is to recognize where our true hope comes from, and the hope of the world is Jesus Christ. It's not the Republican Party. It's not their Democratic Party. It's none of the parties. As Christians, our hope is in Jesus Christ. And so today, as we move beyond the ballot box, we want to we wanna move beyond us and them. And I'll talk about what that looks like, and we're going to use we're gonna use the book of Jonah. But what I, what I want to do for a minute here is because this is a time in our society where anxiety is high and anger is high and frustration is high. And we feel it. We feel it in our guts. We, and so, so one thing, like I'm going to jump into Pastor Dave. If you don't know Pastor Dave, he's a pastor. He also is a licensed psychologist, and he runs our counseling center, Renewed Hope Counseling. And... And so counselors, psychologists, one of their anxiety, you know, ways that you deal with anxiety is you zoom out and you look at the big picture and you take what's going on in the moment and you say, okay, I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to see how this plays in the big span of history and in the big, you know, the, the view of, of my lifetime. And so I want to say this, as we seek to move beyond us and them, we've always been us and them. Ain't always been us and them. I, now, in the first service, 
which was a little, I mean, the first service is always small. It was smaller than usual because some people, you know, came to this one so they could be at the meeting. But some, you know, people, more than one person knew who this was. Who knows what, what this is depicting? Burr and Hamilton. All right. So for those of you who don't know, the year is 1804. The guy shooting the gun was at that time the sitting vice president of the United States of America. The sitting vice president of the United States of America. <laughs> he took time out of his busy schedule <laughs> to go have a duel with who's the guy he shoots? Alexander Hamilton. The kids know this a little bit more now because Hamilton came out as a rap. So they're like, oh, he knows. He's not going to throw away his shot, but he did. And that's another story for another time. I won't start singing. Don't worry. <laughs> Hamilton, I know none of us carry money anymore. Maybe some of us do. If you do, pull out a 10. Pull out a tenor. Who's, whose picture is that? Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. The former Secretary of the Treasury, who, who gets into this duel, they get into a duel. Burr and Hamilton get into a duel. And Hamilton is killed, literally killed. This, this kind of us and them tension, it literally does go all the way back to the founding. I'm going to say in about five minutes, that it's a good thing. So just hear me out for a second. That that tension is a good thing. But let me show you what I mean by it. we've always been us and them. Once you get past Washington, our first president, who ran unopposed, every election from there on out is contested. Every single one. And just do this. Do this in your head for a second. The last, just go back 200 years, we're longer than 200 years. In, in the 1810s, we got into some really like lopsided elections. But, but go back 100, uh, 200 years, excuse me, in our nation's history. What do you think the highest winning percentage was in an election? Highest winning percentage in the last 200 years. It's a pretty long period of time. Presidential election. Highest vote total a winning candidate got. Was that, how, how many? 58? 58? It's, it's 61. That's it. Now, 61, if I told you the year that it happened was 1964 that we got 61%. What happened in 63? Kennedy was shot. You think some of that 61% was in honor of Kennedy? Of course it was. The highest one was 61%, which means in every election, at least, and it's more like 45, 46, 47% of the people didn't vote for the winner. In every election, 45, 46, 47 percent, sometimes more. Lincoln, over 60 percent of the people who voted didn't vote for Abraham Lincoln. He won because there were multiple candidates. When, and and here, here's what we think. We think our, our side loses, that's it. no. Because 40 to 45 percent of the country agrees with you, voted the way you did. And they have representatives in the House of Representatives who are still advocating for what you advocate for. They are in the United States Senate still advocating what you advocate for. People from your side, even though you lost this one, you'll probably win the next one. That's kind of how we are around this place, right? But... You, you've lost now. You still have members of the federal judiciary who were appointed 
by one of the people that you put into office, and they serve for life. So they're not going anywhere. And, 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 I'll get to why this is, is a good thing for a second. But once, once we get past Washington, there, is, there are these two sides. And the two sides in the early days were represented by Alexander Hamilton, and if you know it, say it. Who was, I, not Burr, but who was, Burr was vice president to Jefferson, okay? Sorry, I'm an old history teacher if you're like, when, when did we drop into history class? We're, we're getting back to the church in a second. So, but, but Jefferson was like, hey man, we don't need government. I mean, we need a little, but not a lot. Smaller the better. Let's let the individuals take care of themselves, make their own decisions, do their own thing. That's how we'll have a good country. Alexander Hamilton's like, nope, that's not how you do it. How you do it is you have a really strong government. Because if you have a strong government, you can have things like roads and ports. You can, you can uh, deal with trade, and you can have control over these things, and then everybody prospers. Hamilton Jefferson, we, and the argument hasn't changed in 230 years. I mean, it's, it's, different, it's different variations of that same thing. So, okay, so we've always been us and them. I, they're part of us in our, you know, wanting to go to despair, you know, we always, we always do that thing. It's never been like this. It's been like this. This is not, hear me, you got to hear what I'm about to say. This is not about finding some mushy middle where we all take all our differences and all the ways we think and, and we do that fake niceness and we say, isn't it just great that we all get along and we don't talk about anything that we really care about? Isn't that lovely? That's not it. If you're passionate about the, the political views that you hold, good. Be passionate good. Be passionate. In your passion, do not sin. And I'm going to get why this is important in, in, just, in just a second. So this is not, this is not saying don't be passionate. This is not don't have strong views. This is not don't stand on your strong views. But see, Okay. <laughs> but what this is, is this is recognizing how Satan wants to take a good process, which is human beings debating. I'm going to show you in one second. Well, let me just show it to you now. All right? This is an invitation. This series, and today but all three, this series is an invitation to wrestle with our faith, our fears, and our idols. Because one of the biggest idols that we have in this society is politics. It's an idol. And we put it on par with God a lot. And we need to repent from that. And so let's do a brief detour into creation, okay? Okay. We, we always got to remember context and, and watch why I say us and them. Now, this is why I say us and them is not a bad thing. So if you were with us over the summer, we were talking about you learn how to put it into context. You learn how to put it into context. And I say, I'm saying that our differences and our passion about our differences is not a bad thing. And you would say to me, if you're, and I'm saying that's scriptural. So if I tell you it's scriptural, if you weren't here in the summer, you're off the hook here. But if I say it's scriptural, you say to me, where is it written? First Corinthians chapter 12, okay? And this is, this is talking about the church and how the church is supposed to run. And it says this. Our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. 
How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the heart, I don't need you. This is the lie of politics. The lie of politics is, I don't need you. The lie of politics is, Burr can get rid of Hamilton because he doesn't need Hamilton. That's a lie. And I'll get a little dramatic, and I'll say it straight from the pit of hell because it divides us, and it makes us angry and murderous people. That's the vice president of the United States, 1804, circa, okay? And see, okay, this is not, this is not written in the scriptures. This is written in my head, what I'm about to say, so you take it for what you will, and I'm going to let you in for a second. If it, if it looks a little cluttered and messy, it is, okay? But look, this is me talking now. What I think has made our country great to the extent that it is great is the debate, the same old debate between Hamilton and Jefferson that has never gone away. That's what makes us great. It's that push and pull between those ideas. It's the back and forth. It's the sometimes you're like, oh, we lost, but then you're like, eh, we lost, but we didn't really lose. We still got all these people all over, and they're advocating, and they're voting against, and they're... That's how, that's how our, our, our country survives all these years, is you have those two opposing forces, and they keep talking to each other, and they keep going back and forth. Because sometimes we need the Jefferson ideas and sometimes we need the Hamilton ideas and wisdom is knowing when we need which. Okay? And that's my head. But I think we've made it 230 plus years because we've been able to do that. So beyond us and them, we come to the book of Jonah. Now, sometimes you come to a book like Jonah and some of us in our modern world, you're like, Jonah, we're going to learn from Jonah. How are we going to learn from Jonah? It's a story about a guy who gets swallowed by a big fish. Like, what? how do we understand this? How do we interpret this? Invitation. Come on November 2nd as we talk about, we got an all-day workshop. We got child care available for that. If you need that, you just got to let us know. And, and we go over how to read the Bible. I don't have time to dive into all that today with Jonah because I just want to tell you this story. And I want to say this about Jonah. Jared Bias says it like this, uh, a writer and a professor. Jonah is an invitation, not just to wrestle with theoretical concepts of forgiveness and justice and mercy, but to be physically part of the story and wrestle with these questions in the context of real human relationships and spiritual experiences. We're supposed to wrestle with this stuff. And the other thing I would say about Jonah is, again, we'll talk about how we understand Scripture. But please recognize that as we read the book of Jonah, this is hysterical. This is comedy. This is satire. This is God having a sense of humor. This is, this is a Saturday Night Live skit from the 700s B.C. You wonder, like we say we're created in the image of God, comedians are created in the image of God. They were reading Jonah, okay? And you're going to recognize it. I, I re hopefully you're going to recognize it. If not, I'll be laughing by myself, and that'll be awkward. But... <laughs> But just come along with me as we dive in, as we dive into Jonah. So here's how Jonah starts. It starts like this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Okay, that's, that's how it starts. But then what happens? But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Okay. First of all, Jonah is a super short book. And I'm going to give you some highlights from it. But you, I mean, here's my encouragement. Over the next couple of days, grab your Bible, open it up, 
read all four chapters. It does not take that long. It, it won't even take you 10 minutes. It's, it's short. But this is how it starts. So let's get some context. So, okay, God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Now, you're like, Nineveh, what is Nineveh? Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, okay? And when Jonah is alive, and when Jonah is uh, writing and doing his thing and being a prophet, the Assyrian Empire actually is in a little bit of a lull at that particular time. But just before that time, and just after that time, they will be strong and powerful. And, and the Israelites hate the Ninevites. Why? Because the Assyrian Empire has hassled them, has taken them over. The, Jonah is in the northern kingdom, right? And they're going to get wiped out not too long after Jonah writes. They're going to get wiped out by the Assyrians. These people do not like each other. But God says to Jonah, go to them. Go to those people. Go to those people you don't like and preach the message I want you to preach. Okay, so the, 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 the easiest way and the fastest way to, to move in the ancient world was by sea. So, so, jo so Jonah gets to the seashore. He gets to a port in Joppa, and he's like, how far can I get from Nineveh? Like, and, and he literally goes... Okay, in his mind, he's going to the end of the earth. He's going like, I, I can't get any farther than Tarshish. That's where I'm going. So he hops on the boat, and off he goes to Tarshish. Okay. So, so oh, wait, wait, wait. So if from God's view, are we ready with the sound back there? So from God's view, I, I think Jonah kind of looks like the kid in this video, okay? So, so, so watch this video. Are you guys ready in the back? Okay, here we go. Okay. Re re I'm running away! <laughs> so <much slides. laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so Jonah's like, I'm running away. I have my Minecraft sword and my skateboard. You said you didn't love me. I said go to bed. Same thing. <laughs> okay, so... So I, I, just, I just picture God just like, seriously, this, this, this is how this is going to play out. Okay. So then the storm comes. Now, watch this, watch this, watch this. When I say this, this, is, this is comedy, this is satire, but, but God is the master storyteller. Okay. If you're, new, if you're new to Christianity and you don't know a lot about the Gospels, you might miss this. But those of you who know the Gospels, this is going to sound a lot like something we see in the Gospels. A lot like it. And if you're new, this is how you learn the stories, right? You, you come and, and we hear. So, okay. So he gets on the ship. And the ship takes off for Tarshish. Off they go. And a huge storm comes up. But Jonah is what? Asleep. In the boat. Do we know any other stories where there's a big, huge storm and somebody's asleep in the boat? We think we're such great storytellers. No greater storyteller than God. So Jesus is asleep in the boat. Jonah is asleep in the boat. What happens when Jesus is asleep in the boat? Everybody's freaked out. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Jonah's asleep in the boat. Everybody's freaked out. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What do they do? Who do they wake up? Jonah. Okay. 
Jonah gets woken up by the sailors. Okay? Now, <laughs> the problem is that Jonah's supposed to go to Nineveh. And he goes to Tarshish. That's the underlying problem in our story. Seems like a real simple solution, doesn't it? Simple. So Jonah, they wake up Jonah. What, do, what should we do? Jonah should probably say, hey guys, bad on me. My bad. I'm running from God. Probably not a good idea. I'm going to repent. I'm going to say I'm sorry. And then I'm going to go right to Nineveh and just turn the boat around. Let's go back. That's what he should say, right? This is how much he can't stand the Ninevites. This is his solution. <laughs> throw me overboard. Pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. And when you read it, I don't want to give it all, all, all the way, but as you're reading it, you're going to see the sailors are like, their prayer is like, God, don't hold this murder against us because basically we know what we're doing here. But do, you, but do you see it? I would, I would rather throw myself into the sea and drown than go talk to those people. <laughs> There's a them of the thems. And I ain't talking to them. Again, right? I'm taking my Minecraft sword and my skateboard and I'm just jumping in. Okay, chapter two. At the end of chapter one, John, this is, okay, this is why I say it's, it's hysterical. It's like he jumps in and he thinks, finally, I'm done with it. What does God do? Scoops in with a big, yeah, you think you're done with it? Here you go. Scoops him up into the, into the belly of the big fish. And there he is chilling. For how long? Don't miss it. Master storyteller, three days. Three days. So, and, and in chapter one, Jonah jumps in because he doesn't want to go talk to these other people because he hates them, sick of them. They're them. <laughs> and God says, oh, that's your plan? That, that's your plan. I'm God. Scoop. And then chapter two is just his prayer. And I'm going to read all the, the, the only one I'm going to read the whole thing is chapter two because his prayer is beautiful. And his prayer's got a little comedy in it, but, but his prayer is beautiful. It goes like this. So, he, so he's sinking. Down goes Jonah. In comes the fish. God is probably just, you know, cracking up like, oh, yeah, he thought he could get away from me. Watch, watch this one, right? And, and in comes the fish. And then Jonah. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Now notice, notice, you hurled me into the depths. Uh, no, God did not hurl him into the depths. He willingly jumped over the side, but be that as it may, you hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas. And the currents swirled about me, and all your waves and breakers swept over me. I said I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. The roots of the mountains, to the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing, ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols... Turn away from the God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will sail, say, salvation comes from the Lord. And then the fish vomited him out onto the shore. And there he is right back where he started from. And God says again, just like the guy 
in, in, the, in, the, in the video said again, okay, kid, put the Minecraft sword, put the, go to bed. But God doesn't say go to bed. God says, go to Nineveh, okay? Yeah, you first might want to take a shower because you stink, okay? <laughs> All right, so he goes, right? Chapter 3, Jonah preaches, they all repent. Everybody, everybody, from the king on down to the, even the animals, even the animals repent. They're like, okay, like back in the old days, when you were repenting, you would put on sackcloth. You would say, look, God, this is, this, uh, this is me. I'm saying that I need to repent. I'm saying I'm done wrong. It was like a way of showing your seriousness and your sorrow. They're like, it's not good enough that we repent. Let's get some extra sackcloth. Let's put it on the animals because we just, we really got to repent. Now you think, so what's chapter four? You think that chapter four should be, Jonah is thrilled because he has been inducted in to the Prophets Hall of Fame because he is the only person ever who preached and everybody repented. Everybody repented. This is good stuff. This is great. We don't even need chapter 4. We don't need chapter 4 because he had a job, he did his job, and everybody repented. But we have a chapter 4. Why do we have a chapter 4? Because Jonah's like me, and maybe Jonah's like you, and Jonah is comfortable in the us and them. So here's Jonah in chapter 4. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. Everybody in Nineveh repented and turned toward God. But to Jonah... This seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Okay, listen to this. Again, he just reminds me, of, and I know I'm like the little kid with the Minecraft sword, right? Part of what I find humorous in this. He says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who, resent, who relents from sending calamity. Now, okay, he's, if you haven't caught on yet, he's got a drama streak, Jonah. Take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live if you're going to even love the Ninevites, if you're even going to care for them. Better for me to die than to live. But the, but the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Now that's verse 4. I'm going to jump up to verse 11. As you're reading it, you will see, I told you this is a humorous book. God's going to play one more practical joke on Jonah and like just kind of give him a little bit of the elbow, okay? It just, because Jonah is just, he's, he refuses to come out of his little whiny, like, oh, this is so terrible that God can love people, even people I don't want him to love, right? But God gets the last word, and God's last word is a question. And he says this, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? He includes animals because they had the sackcloth on too. And see, let's, let's, let's hear from Jesus because again, in Jonah's story, right, you see parallels to Jesus. Because what what God is saying to Jonah is what Jesus says to all of us in the Gospels. He says this, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Wait, wait. Why would you do that? That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is 
perfect. And, and to make the point about imperfection, we had to leave it. I <laughs> saw this in the the red didn't the red circle didn't transfer properly. Just to make the point that I'm not perfect yet. <laughs> All right, but but it says be perfect. If you were with us last week, we saw this word before. We were in John's first letter to the church. John writes these letters to the church to help them out. And in that letter, he said, when you love each other, God's love is what? Made complete in you. And you're just like, yeah, but Joe, it says be there for, or be, be perfect. It's the same word. Made complete in the Greek is teleos. Be perfect in the Greek is teleos. You translate it differently depending on the context. But it means the same thing. It means teleos is the goal. Te teleos is the direction that we're going. And the direction that we're going is following Jesus Christ. That's the direction that we're going. So if Jesus loves and forgives even his enemies, then we love and forgive even our enemies. If Jesus hangs on the cross and can look at those people and say, Father, forgive them for I don't, they don't know what they're doing, then we are made complete. We become perfect. We become children of our Heavenly Father when we look like our Heavenly Father, when we look like Jesus Christ, when we act like Jesus Christ. And I don't always want to do that because I can get real comfortable in us and them. I can get real self-righteous I can think I, I got all the answers, and I know. And I don't want to admit that I need you. Especially if you think differently than I do. And if, you, if you've been around for the last 18, 19 years, You know, when you're you, 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 when you're the pastor of the church, there's there's a lot that there is a lot of power in the local body that comes with that. But you have to use it to serve God, right? And if you'll notice, over the years, I surround my, surround myself consistently and constantly with people who think very differently than I do, all the time. And 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 if I stop doing that, you kick me in the butt and ask me what I'm doing. Because we need each other. And that's not written in my head. That's written in the word of God. We can't say to each other, I don't need you. We do need each other. So, the call to faith, our questions for today. These are in the prayer right up that goes out on Monday morning. These are in your, uh, what, do you, what do you got in your hand? That thing. You got a bulletin. Thank you, Bill. Uh, in, in, they're in your bulletin there um, so, so that you have them. I think, I think these, are good, these are a good guide for us. These are Jonah questions. These are questions that over these next, over this season, that can be contentious, that our anxiety can get up, that we can, all that stuff happens. These are good questions for us because the point for those of us who follow Jesus Christ is to always be asking God, how are you molding and shaping me in this situation, in this moment? So we ask, who are my Ninevites? Who's my them? Maybe you're like me. There are, there are times, yeah, I would jump overboard before I would go to Nineveh. I mean, can we be real? Okay. What attitudes and actions do I need 
to repent from now. How am I running from God's call? How am I running from God's call? When, when we say stuff like, well, well, this time it's different, so I have a right to do this or do that. Okay. You're running from God's call. Sorry, but you are. Because God told you to love your enemies and to pray for them. How will I pray in the fear and the darkness that I feel now? How will I pray? Notice, I'm not saying pretend like it's just put on a happy face and smile. You feel that. Many of us feel that. Many of us are worried. Many of us are scared. How are we going to pray? How are we going to pray? How will I stray true to my Christian identity in this election season? How will I love and pray for my enemies? And so what we're going to do right now is we're going to pray. We have done this before, and, we're gonna, and we'll probably do it again. We did it a couple of years ago in the 2022 election. We did it the day after uh, the assassination attempt back in July, um, where we prayed. And here's the thing. Um, this, to me, is the highest prayer that you can pray for anybody. So you say, well, how do, I don't even know how to pray for that person. I don't even know how to pray for that leader. That, I'm so worried if that person or that person gets in power. Like, how do I pray for them? Here's our highest prayer that we can pray for anybody. Let your kingdom come in their life. Let your will be done in their life. Let your kingdom come in their life. Let your will be done. So what we're going to do before we take communion, I mean, you know, Jesus says, you know, if you, if you realize you have a problem with your brother or sister, first deal with that and then come, right? And so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do that. And Dave and I, so we're going to get to the candidates, but we've got a few things uh, that we're going to repent of first, and then we're going to then we're going to do um, then we're going to do the candidates. Okay. All right. So would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you, and we come to you at a time maybe where some of us are feeling that fear and feeling that darkness, and uh, and it's real. And some of us are like, I I don't feel that, but. I just can't wait for this all to be over. And maybe if that's where you're at, that, that's, that's cool too. Wherever you're at, I think we come to God. And we come to God and we be real with God and we tell, tell God, you know, this is, this is what's going on with me right now. So, Lord, I repent. And if you need to repent of the same, I invite you to do it as well. But I repent for giving in to despair for giving in to, oh my gosh, you know, we're never going to get through this. Oh my gosh, if this happens, then that's going to happen. Just the endless, you know, rat reel that we run on in our heads. And it just pulls us into despair, and it's a despair that glorifies Satan and does not glorify you. So forgive me for giving in to despair. Father God, repent for participating, bearing false witness against political rivals, or maybe grabbing onto a story, talking heads are saying that isn't even true, and just running with it, spreading it. Just repent of that. Heavenly Father, I, I repent that I don't begin with prayer. I got... <laughs> I got to be sinking in the ocean, scooped up by a fish in complete darkness before I go, oh yeah, maybe I could have just started with prayer in the first place. Help my first reaction to be to come to you in prayer. This day and every day. 
And so now we pray for uh, the candidates for elective office. Uh, some of them we're going to pray for by name. Some of them we're going to just pray by position, okay? Um, so for the candidates for U.S. president, and as I say the person's name, then you'll, we'll all respond. Let your kingdom come in their life. Let your will be done in their life. For candidate Donald Trump, let your kingdom come in his life. Let your will be done in his life. For can candidate Kamala Harris, let, let your, your kingdom, kingdom come in her life. life. Let, let your, your will, will be, be done, done in her life. life. For all third-party candidates who have the courage to challenge the status quo, let your kingdom come, come in their life. life. Let, let your, your will, will be done, done in their life. life. For the candidates for United States Senate, let your kingdom come, come in their life. life. Let, Let your will, will be, be done, done in their life. And specifically for candidate Alyssa Slotkin. Let your kingdom come in her life. Let your will be done in her life. For candidate Mike Rogers. Let, Let your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come in his life. life. Let, Let your, your will, will be done, done in his life. life. For all the candidates for the United States House of Representatives. Let your kingdom come in their life. Let your will be done in their life. For Correct. candidates for state government. Let your, Let your kingdom, kingdom come, come in their, their life. life. Let, Let your, your will be done, done in their life. And for the candidates for local government. Let, Let your kingdom come in their life. Let, Let your will, will be done, done in their lives. All right, we're going to finish with uh, communion now. Um, and as we do that, I, I just, when we think about this meal and, and what it is, and we think about the divisions in the ancient world, the, the divisions between the Israelites and the, and, and the Assyrians and the Ninevites. Paul has this beautiful line of Scripture. I mean, it's, this is fantastic. And this is what we're celebrating in this, in this simple act, the simple meal. He says, in Christ... The dividing wall of hostility has been broken down, has been eliminated. And, and, and as I, I repent, I repent that I, I just, I want to just, I want to, I want to put a wall between me and people who think differently than me. I, I mean, I do that. We do that. That is so natural in us, and, and the only one it brings glory to is Satan. Because as we divide and devour each other, Satan wins. He broke down the dividing wall of hostility between us. Let's, let's not put anything between us. Let's keep our focus and our eyes on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who for the joy set before him did what? Endured the cross scorning its shame, calling out on that cross, Father, they do not know what they do. Please forgive them. And he told us what's happening. On the night before he died, he said, take this, this bread that he broke. Take this, all of you, and eat it. This, this is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me. Do this in memory of Jesus then live in memory of Jesus. Be teleos. Be made complete. Be perfect by following him and following his love and loving the people that he told us to love, which is everybody. And how did he make that possible? Then he took a cup. He said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This cup is my blood shed for you, shed for many, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as your children who have gathered here today, we have taken a moment to confess to you those places where we're missing it, those places where you call us one way, and we're hopping on boats to Tarshish. So help us to stay right where you've planted us, Help us to stay in your love and guide us and lead us to be your light in a world that desperately needs it. And so we humbly ask you to bless this bread 
and to bless the cup. Let it remind us of your love, fill us with your love, and most importantly, strengthen us in your love so that we can do the difficult work that you have called us to do in this time and place. In Jesus' holy name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. I'm going to invite you to rise, and let's lift our voices and praise our God. This could be a great song to end our series with us. Uh, whenever we're tempted to go to our sinful nature and fight, and uh, that we would just fight on our knees. broken world, let's be the people that God has called us to be. Let's be people of deep love, of deep compassion, who look out for each other and care for each other. And as we go from this place, if we're going to do that in this world that is broken and hurting, then we're going to need our Lord to go with us. So as we go, may the Lord himself bless you and keep you. May he be kind and gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace, which surpasses all our understanding. And all God's people said, amen. amen.